My name is uh, Uberto, and uh, I will uh, talk about you in a very interesting topic, one that at least for me is uh, very interesting and I'm very passionate about it, which is legacy code, which is probably not what you associate with something interesting. <laughs> So, uh, how many of you have heard of the term uh, uh, brownfield development? Okay, so this is probably a word that's a bit uh, technical. But brownfield uh, in, uh, is a technical term in the uh, building industry. That means when you have to build something uh, on a field that has something before. But also in our, uh, in IT, at least in London, is a common term uh, that means some project that uh, it's not uh, from uh, scratch, which will be the greenfield development, but it's a project that uh, basically you have uh, to build a feature of something that is already there and probably not in the best of shape. And um, when uh, people usually heard about brownfield development, uh, basically they just scare away. <laughs> so when uh, there is the interview, people are very scared to say something about uh, is a brownfield. Uh, <laughs> we can say something more interesting. but. Um, well, I, that was also my, uh, my uh, position until I went to Japan and uh, I found uh, this uh, very interesting uh, Japanese uh, tradition that is basically if you break uh, a cup, something valuable, instead of um, throw it away or instead of to do some kind of uh, um, transparent, uh, invisible fix, uh, which for sure one will be not invisible. You kind of uh, emphasize uh, the that fact that uh, the, the object was broken and then you repair. And this is, um, is a story with the uh, Emperor of Japan and uh, his favorite cup or something like that. And uh, in, I mean, this is uh, Kintsugi, it's called, and uh, it's a Japanese uh, old tradition. But, um, okay, the tradition is very interesting uh, and <laughs> you can study about it. What I wanted to talk about uh, today instead is that uh, this kind of uh, made me think that uh, maybe we can do something similar with our code. No, I mean, not something that we can put in a museum, but at least try to fix things before throw it away. And uh, what is the... <laughs> Ideal state. The ideal state of our project will be something like the uh, the blue uh, curve, something like that. Every time we add a new feature in our project, it will take more or less a kind of constant time. It will be a little more, little less, but more or less a future, more or less the same constant. If I wanted to add this feature today, or I wanted to add it in uh, next year, it should take more or less the same time. This is the ideal project. In the reality, what's happened is that as the project became more complicated, adding new feature became more slow and uh, it takes more time and uh, it's very costly. So at some point, someone will say, okay, let's cut the loss and restart from scratch. But let's discuss about it. The common problem of a legacy system and uh, I mean, I think you know more or less what we intend with legacy system. So how many of you uh, work on legacy system or have? Well, no, not, well, <laughs> maybe a little more. Uh, of course, hopefully not 100%, but uh, I think we all know, I mean, at least all uh, IT professional with a bit of experience, of experience know what is uh, working uh, in uh, obsolete uh, technology. And uh, all legacy systems tend to have a more or less a similar problem. And that, um, you know, the technical debt idea. So how many of you, let's do a bit of interactive, know about the technical, yeah, it's about, yeah, the idea of technical debt is something like uh, um, you write a code and you try to do the best code possible. And uh, at some point, uh, Someone, the manager came and said, yeah, we don't have time. You have to cut corners. You have to do this. And we have, we have to deliver now, otherwise there will be no day after tomorrow. So we have to do it by tomorrow. And so you say, okay, I can do this stuff that is really bad, but uh, 
we have to fix in the future. So you kind of accumulate a kind of interest on a bad code. And this is what is called the technical debt. But uh, for legacy system, the technical debt is so huge that you basically don't care anymore because you say there is no way we can repay this. So let's just go on. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, you, you is a, in a bad situation, but uh, the, the, the origin was good. I mean, uh, the original system was a, a good system for what it was supposed to do, but then, uh, you know, people get carried on and adding stuff and stuff. And then uh, this also bring up a kind of a situation where you don't care about safety anymore. <laughs> you just say, whatever, it works, it works. <laughs> don't uh, let's uh, get uh, stuck in te technologies, uh, security or stuff like that. It works, okay, let's, uh, let's put in production. And uh, there is a reason of this, and uh, the, it's called uh, the law of uh, broken windows, which basically say that uh, if you see a building with uh, knives, you probably don't want it to take a, a stone and break one windows. I mean, it's not something that normal people will do. But if you see a building uh, very uh, abandoned uh, with uh, 90% of the uh, windows broken and there is uh, just one uh, intact panel. I mean, it's very tempting to break also that. <laughs> because uh, who cares and, uh, you know. And uh, so this is uh, uh, creating the grade over the grade. And uh, in the uh, legacy system, we have this always. Con I mean, I, I work in a project where Basically, every single week there was a, a P1. I mean, it was in a big bank in uh, financial sector, so something with a lot of money, and uh, the software was making a lot of money, so it was really important. And still, every week, single week, there was some uh, uh, priority one. I mean, uh, some bugs that really created a problem with the business that really wasn't. And it was like this every week, and every week everybody seems completely surprised. Wow, how can it be possible? I mean, it was same last week. Yeah, but last week it was a completely different. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. And then uh, at some point someone they said, okay, let's remove this uh, project from the stack. And then nobody really knows. Can we? Cannot we? We really don't know because the system is so complicated that maybe someone uh, it really, really wanted to do that project. So this is the situation. I think uh, we are on the same page. And so, what is this usual situation? Okay, <coughs> let's rewrite it. Let's uh, write the Shining and New. Yeah, I mean, my daughter really likes uh, this movie, so. <laughs> One, uh, so many times. But I wish you that uh, because something is new will be better. I mean, sometimes it's not that you need an uh, atomic bomb uh, just to get rid of some bugs. And, uh, also, there is a kind of a feature creeping uh, tendency. So when you start to do something new, the people say, oh, we can add another thing or two that we didn't thought before. And then also, of course, you're writing something new, but uh, then uh, you put some, okay, it's new, let's put something temporary there, and then you kind of forgot. <laughs> and this is all stuff that happens every time you some, write something new. And, uh, I mean, it's also quite sad, but it happens that uh, the new Greenfield project uh, that you got hired to, to write, uh, more or less uh, the half of the project uh, they decide, uh, no, really, really, this project is not cutting. Uh, we, we have uh, to shelve it and uh, fix in the old one because the new is not going to work. And so what do you do now? You cannot do the finish the new one because it's not working and that the old one is very, very deteriorated in the meanwhile. Uh, I mean, I've been in that situation, so maybe also some of you. And uh, every time, this is a bit of a, when we start thinking about the rewrite, the rewrite <laughs> is always very um, uh, attractive. 
But uh, there is always this tendency to uh, underestimate how difficult it is uh, to revise something. Because we have uh, an old system that is working, and the old system code is clearly crap because we didn't write, or maybe we didn't write in the past, so it's crap. And it's working, so I mean, if those uh, terrible programmers are able to do, we, are, we can definitely do better. But this is uh, a kind of bias, because uh, it's, it's in that situation, but it's still working, and it's absolutely not given that we are able to, uh, to, to, to write it again. And then there is always the data migration, which is always underestimated. It's like no matter how much uh, you uh, estimate for the data migration, the data migration will take more, even considering that you know about this. It will still <laughs> So the idea is uh, something different. So let's change our perspective. Let's change how we look at uh, legacy code. So legacy code basically is a code that uh, it works. It works and uh, it gives a value to the business. And uh, those two things are really, really important. And also it's kind of scaling. I mean, it can have all the, its problem, but uh, if it's not working, it's not legacy code. It's just something that you want to throw it away and <laughs> don't forget about. But if it's working and it's more or less it's sustaining the business, like it was in the example that I did before, that every week I have a big issue, but it was still working. I mean, it was still making money most of the time. Um, so it's something that is really valuable for them. And uh, instead of rewriting something new, we can take a kind of a page from the Boy Scouts and trying to do something better with it. And uh, so instead of us looking at a big uh, rewrite, we can uh, start thinking about a progressive rewrite. When uh, we want only to fix one thing, then make it work, and then fix an another thing. And uh, every step, because the big difference is that we want for every step to be uh, able to, to stay alone. So we do step one, and then if step one is okay enough, we can leave it at this. It, it, it must have a, not a temporary solution. It must be something that it works for them. Uh, the problem with this is that sometimes it takes longer than just on the paper at least. That's just a, a, a straight rewrite because we have to, do, to take a lot of uh, complicated uh, uh, part. But uh, the big advantage is that it will be safe because every time uh, you can stop and uh, you are in a safe position. Uh, by the way, this is in Japan and I really have uh, no idea why, why they decided to cross a, a, a water in this way. <laughs> I thought that is very cool. <laughs> but uh, this is, yes, kind of aesthetic. Um, <coughs> so for example, uh, the bit of classic in uh, our IT, we have a, a client server application uh, with uh, uh, Oracle and we wanted to put something new with uh, uh, UI done in uh, JavaScript uh, running on uh, Cassandra. So how we do that? We, we, I mean, it's not mm, doing a, a, a rewrite from scratch from the beginning is very risky. So my idea is that we can, for example, take uh, the current application, open a REST API on the current application, adding, I mean. So we keep uh, all the logic in the current application, and uh, we just uh, start writing a new UI. So we, we keep uh, the current application without using the UI, and uh, we use JavaScript that uh, speak with the current application. Once we are kind of happy with the JavaScript part, we can start writing a new uh, backend, and then when we have uh, the new backend that uh, is able to uh, manage at least one uh, user case, we can start of splitting the UI that goes a bit of on the old one and a bit of the new one. Or we can also do another way. We can uh, keep uh, the current application and start writing a new backend instead of uh, going uh, to Oracle, let's go to Cassandra, and uh, bit by bit uh, transfer the backend. 
And when we have the backend, we start to work on the front end. I mean, we can do both ways. Uh, of course, each application has a different uh, requirement. But that's the point. Not looking at uh, legacy code as a, a liability, as a problem, but looking at legacy code as something that uh, is a treasure that we just have to fix and make it shiny. Because the big problem is that when we have a legacy code and we cannot touch the code, that is really a bad, a bad place to be in. But if uh, we can improve, uh, we can do much better. And, uh, okay, that was uh, a big uh, right, but uh, there could be also less drastic cases uh, in which uh, we don't have uh, to change uh, completely the architecture of the application, but we want only to change the code. I mean, we, we are kind of happy with the application with the uh, main technical choice, but uh, the code is really terrible. And so we want only to refactor the code. But when I was basically preparing these slides, I found that this, uh, little uh, uh, difference that uh, if you change the code uh, in, a, in a way that uh, improves the code, uh, it's not simple refactoring, it's a kind of a code rejuvenation because you want to fix bugs, you don't want to exactly 100% respect the current behavior, you want to do something better. So it's a uh, it's a kind of a code rejuvenation. So you apply new pattern to the code, you try to simplify, you try to uh, uh, avoid bugs, but keeping the main, uh, of course, the main use case. So the idea is uh, changing the, uh, I mean, forgetting about the total rewrite and the small fix that uh, Dutch tape, you know, that uh, small fix that just a broken windows, just, okay, let's just fix one windows, maybe with a bit of cardboard. And uh, instead, uh, start thinking about, uh, it's just a, a kind of mental change. Uh, code uh, rejuvenation and uh, code rewrite. And then we can discuss. This is a kind of uh, open discussion. We wanted to rewrite or we wanted to rejuvenate? Well, uh, it really depends. If uh, we are able to, those are a bit of uh, uh, suggestions, but uh, if we are able to revise something in uh, less than two weeks, for example, that probably means that we know what uh, we are talking about, because we, if we estimate more than two weeks, probably we don't really know what we are talking about. So if uh, we can do at, at least a single step in two weeks, okay, probably it's faster to just rewrite that piece. But, um, you know, when I was a young programmer, I was uh, in this company, it was still in Italy, and um, there was um, another young programmer, I mean, it was I more or less like me, and we were given the task to, to refactor, to rejuvenate some code. And basically, he spent one week on uh, a function that was a function, very complicated function that I couldn't really understand. So I say, okay, you can do that. <laughs> and uh, he, he spent one week on that function, and uh, he said it's too complicated to fix. So I'll rewrite, and uh, he wrote the function one week. And um, the curious thing is that the new function, well, the, the old function was working fine in like 90-90% uh, of the cases, but there was one uh, one two or three cases basically out of hundreds where it was failing. And uh, the new function, curiously, was working fine 90% of the case, but in two or three cases out of hundreds, it was not working, and he has no idea why. <laughs> so rewriting completely is not given that you are right, even if you know all the, all the stuff that happened before. And. Uh, Curiously, when uh, I'm talking about uh, this stuff uh, to other colleagues and stuff like that, this conversation really, really kind of uh, happened all and over again. And someone was complaining to me, ah, oh, you like a legacy code? No, oh, I hate a legacy code. Ah, oh, why? Oh, our le le legacy code is terrible, but it's critical for business, so we cannot uh, throw it away. And I say, okay, you know, but you can rejuvenate it. You can improve our existing code. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that. Uh, I can show you how if you have a, no, no, I don't need any help with that. We absolutely know how to do that. So you can start to rejuvenate. Oh, no, no, our code is impossible to touch. 
and I have a, this conversation now over here. <laughs> okay. So I I did this talk because I really think that uh, no, it's true. I mean, if you really don't want to believe it's uh, your problem, but it's true that you can really rejuvenate any possible code. At least I never found a kind of code that you really cannot improve. But uh, so uh, let's uh, go on uh, something technical now. Um, these are a bit of um, anti-pattern which are kind of uh, classical for legacy code and uh, you may have heard of or anyway. Stuff pipes is probably the most typical where basically in a big legacy system you have uh, a lot of uh, copy paste, basically stuff that is uh, almost identical apart from a uh, few key things that does almost the same things over and over again. Because uh, of course when someone say, okay, we also need, uh, for example, I work in a financial industry, someone's scheme and say, oh, we need also to work on uh, swaps. Uh, wh what are swaps, how they work? Ah, uh, it's more like an option, but with this and this and this and different. Okay, let's take uh, the option code, uh, copy paste, uh, and then uh, rename uh, to swap. Okay, tell me where I have uh, to change. And uh, it happens uh, all the time. So this is how legacy code. And then uh, there's a lava flow, which is another thing. That at some point, uh, someone say, we have to clean up uh, this stuff. Let's bring everything to XML, because XML will sure give us uh, the solution. Um, you start uh, translating everything to XML, and then some point someone came and say, XML is so old. I mean, we have to switch to JSON. I mean, come on, guys, you cannot still use in XML. Okay, let's start uh, rewriting all the XML uh, specific code to JSON code. And uh, more or less in the middle, someone can say, JSON, you're still using JSON now. You have to use YAML. Let's uh, rewrite everything. YAML is so much cooler than JSON. And so you have a bit of code that is using configuration in XML, someone that is taking a parameter in JSON, and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, another typical is the shotgun surgery, which is, um, um, but in a sense, is a bit of the opposite of stove types. So it means that uh, there are a few critical functions which are more or less used everywhere. So every time you don't know add a new parameter to some input, you have to add this new parameter also to half of the of your code because it's used everywhere. I mean, it's using some methods which are used everywhere. So you have to manage these new fields in a lot of places that you really don't know what to do with that field. And ideally, we should say, okay, if you wanted to fix a bug, you have only to touch one module, one class in a module, one method in one class. So something that is uh, cohesive. But uh, in a legacy system, sometimes you, you really have to, to touch so, so many things just to fix a single thing. And the opposite is, uh, yeah, the classical, the God class, when uh, you start uh, having classes so big because you wanted to add an if, you wanted to add something specifically, and you say, okay, I don't have the time to refactor this, I don't have the time to rethink the architecture, just let's add this uh, 50 line of code, 100 lines of code, stuff like that. And you have methods of a thousand, class of uh, more than 10,000 stuff. Um, okay, one uh, little uh, uh, suggestion. Uh, a friend of mine wrote uh, this book, which is really, really good. Uh, and um, Basically, the idea is that uh, if you, uh, you you have a Git, you have a subversion, whatever, and uh, there is a lot of uh, social information associated with uh, your code. And uh, if you have, uh, for example, to explain to some manager why you have to do a factoring, or exactly, or also the opposite, you are a kind of a supervisor, you want to check that. Uh, the team will uh, uh, factor the piece that is really critical because also sometimes people just like refactor code just uh, for refactoring sake. And uh, basically, this there is a lot of uh, information on this book about how to pick up uh, the right uh, piece of code uh, which is more critical because you will see that uh, uh, I mean basically scanning the Git uh, logs or subversion logs you see the piece of code where so, so many people are working on, and usually those are the problem. 
But let's say that, okay, we identify what we want to say and how we do the refactoring. And uh, if you take any books about refactoring, let's say, it's very easy. If you wanted to do some refactoring, first you write your unit test. You put everything you want to refactor under unit test, so you are sure that you're breaking anything. And then they have these nice uh, refactoring patterns. Uh, okay, that's nice, but how we can put under test if we don't refactor the code? Because our class is not a class that we can, I mean, in my case, all my classes, they cannot just take a, if they start from unit test from the beginning, it's okay. But if it's uh, all the classes, I cannot ever put them. So we have a kind of a catch-22 situation. You know, where the idea of catch-22 was um, a nice novel. And basically, it was a bomber in the Second World War. I mean, a pilot of a bomber. And uh, it, it, of course, he didn't want to, to fly or and do the war. So if uh, you are naming crazy, basically, you, you, can, uh, you, you can avoid it to fly the bomber. It would be stupid to put a crazy guy on a uh, pilot. But uh, if you wanted to avoid the world, you are not crazy by definition. <laughs> so this is what. Uh, and this is a kind of a circular situation. And uh, basically, working on this stuff, I came out with a bit of a suggestion, which they call uh, alchemical rejuvenation. And, uh, the main idea is that uh, we wanted to take our code, seal, split it in uh, modules, and then clean up a, a slice of the code, which is uh, small enough to be uh, cleaned up. And um, why I call it uh, chemical? Well, it was cool, but also I was reading this book, which is also another nice book, if you are interested in uh, science history. And, um, Basically, the idea that alchem alchemy in uh, the Middle Age and the uh, beginning of Renaissance was a really a uh, bleeding edge science, and it uh, was able to do very complicated uh, experiments. And uh, their um, scientific framework was not completely off. Basically, they were thinking that uh, all the metals was uh, a kind of a degree of uh, purity. So you can take a, a kind of impure metal and then clean up and depurate all the fats that are not uh, impure, which are not pure, and basically come up with the, finally with the gold. Which at that point of uh, progressive, it was kind of, um, was a testable uh, assertion that uh, also gave us a lot of uh, chemical experiment. And um, was not completely a stupid idea to start with. And so, I mean, also this idea of purification of our code, uh, I like. So, uh, let's go a bit practical. Step zero, simplify onboarding. This is something that <coughs> when you have a, a legacy project uh, and uh, you want uh, someone to, to work on it, uh, this is always uh, something that people forget about. Because uh, if you have to work on a, a legacy project, sometimes it takes weeks to be able to touch the code. Just because you need a special environment, you need a special setup in the IDE. Sometimes you cannot uh, work from the IDE, you need some tools, you need some special hardware, some special machine, and it's a nightmare. And, um, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, there is uh, no way why if uh, someone with a good uh, uh, legacy system knowledge can uh, set up, uh, I mean, can be a Docker image, a virtual machine, um, Ansible, uh, can be just a few bash scripts. Something that uh, you take a new guy, you run uh, this uh, wiki page, do everything that is there, and you're able to touch the code. This is very important because it makes everything uh, so much easier. And then, you, you need to have an end-to-end -end test. And uh, end-to-end -end test, uh, what I mean here with end-to-end -end test is that something, in, you take the system that we are talking about, we are wanting to say, so something that must be monolithic application, a bunch of uh, services or whatever, but without uh, anything that we don't care about and with all the stuff that we care about. And uh, just to look at what is uh, the input and what are the output. I mean, output can be writing on the DB, can be writing on uh, uh, system bus, input can be UI, can be 
REST API, it can be uh, systems, uh, message systems. But uh, what we want to do basically is having some test that this input is this output, this input is this output. And uh, it will be nice if uh, the input is something uh, that makes sense, uh, like a user put uh, some uh, bind instruction and uh, the result is that these lines on the tables are created. This is kind of a very nice situation because we have a use case with the test. Sometimes this is not really possible because the system is so complicated, there are so many systems involved. So you just take a, a, a dump of uh, what the inputs are and uh, you have a dump of the output are. And this, those two dumps are completely um, unreadable for humans. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, we just wanted to preserve the state. I mean, to show that uh, this is what the old system does, so we can make sure. So this uh, cannot be your normal uh, assessment test. Now what I want to, a point that I want to make is that, uh, okay, you start this process. You, first you did uh, the uh, simplify the uh, access to the code. Second, you write the test. It takes time. I mean, it can also take some weeks to do this. But uh, you don't have to see these weeks as a wasted time, not even investment time, because you already have a very good uh, outcome. So after these two weeks, uh, you already have something that you before didn't have. You already have a value because you have some test that before you didn't have. So you can run this test. Even if you don't do any other of the steps of this process, you already have the test. So you can already have some value that you before didn't have, and it can help you. And you have the onboarding process that also help you. So it's okay, it can take one week, it can take two weeks, it can take one month in a big project, but uh, you already have something that is actually useful for the user, so for the business. I mean. But okay, then uh, once we have this, we can finally touch the code. But before doing some real improvement, we, are, we have to take a small chunk of code, that's something that we want to work on. And when we split the modules, <coughs> remember like an onion, always split vertically. We don't want to have a UI module, domain module, persistence module. We want to have a, I don't know, option module, a security module, everything that is vertical, that goes from a UI to, uh, to persistence, to, to the final output. There could be some, of course, some uh, kind of shared library for persistence or whatever, but uh, each of the modules of our application must be completely independent. I mean, it, it can have some, uh, for example, this module to do very complicated uh, uh, financial product is calling another module to do a simpler uh, financial product, but just call the module at the beginning, get the result at the back, and then keep processing. It's not going inside the module. So they can call each other, but only at the, the top level. And when we have our small module, okay, this is something that we can refactor finally. Okay, this is where we can enjoy yourself. When we clean up, we can start with another module. So basically this is uh, the visual recipe. And um, this is more or less the idea. But uh, each step, uh, notice that you can step uh, this test. I mean, you, you don't have a time to split completely the module. Okay, you still have uh, some value. You have only to split one module. Okay, you have uh, still some value. You can do other stuff, but the one that you wanted to clean up. And of course, if you just have uh, to add a new feature, once you clean up a single module, you can uh, add that feature to that module and close it and maybe you don't need to touch that application for another year. But uh, if after one other year, when someone else wants to touch something else, you can just do a, a little more step. This uh, should kind of uh, stop the low broken windows because you started to clean up things. And yeah, so I'll uh, present here for uh, simple techniques. And then um, everything, if you don't understand the code, everything is on GitHub, so we can collect it. So first is, uh, the first step in uh, Alchemy was uh, 
putrefact in the, the dragon. So let's putrefact uh, the singletons. We don't want singletons. And for singletons, here I mean some object which are shared between modules. I mean, ideally, I don't really want a singleton inside module as eta, but that's not a big deal. The, what is really important is there cannot, I mean, if you have an independent module, there can, cannot be some object that are causing all the modules directly. For stuff that uh, really have to be used for all the modules, for example, I don't know, database connection can be, you, have, you can use something like an upper context pattern that basically you give it the upper, the upper context at the beginning of the module, and then inside the module you just uh, touch the upper context. But then you can decide exactly what can be done or not done by each module. So this is the first step, which is more or less automatic. I mean, you just have to look at the, uh, most of these steps should be something that, uh, I mean, IntelliJ should be able, for example, to refactor automatically or Eclipse. And so you don't really need a unit test for this stuff because it's almost automatic. You just uh, sim uh, substitute uh, one reference with another reference. <coughs> and um, so this is a bit more difficult. So basically, okay, we wanted to create a new module. And uh, I'll show you, we don't have much time, but I'll show you some code example. And um, so basically, this was almost production code. Almost, I mean, I clean up a bit, but it was more or less. And uh, the problem was that I wanted to create a new module from uh, the stuff, uh, but I don't want a new module. To, uh, I don't want the new module to have uh, anything to do with the connection and the uh, config manager. Here, the config manager was doing some configuration, and the connection was the connection DB. Those stuff, uh, I don't want them in the new module. But all the rest of the execute method, yes, I want in the new model. Mm. So what, we, we remember that we have uh, this kind of uh, high level uh, framework testing, but we don't have a unit testing at this point of our uh, factor. So we, we have to do very slowly and very uh, precisely to do some uh, change of the code because we don't want to introduce bugs. So basically the idea is that uh, we create a new interface, the one on, on, on the top of the left, uh, data context. And this basically, this is uh, yeah, the idea of the application context. So we have uh, uh, this uh, interface that we'll uh, uh, remove from our module, the stuff that we don't want to look at. And then, when we introduce the new interface, basically, we created the new interface and then uh, we don't touch the actual code because we just created the interface, we put the stuff inside the interface and then we got the code as before. Then uh, we want to uh, actually, okay, that is a uh, first step, but then uh, we try, okay, why we are passing config manager to that uh, module to my code? And in looking inside my code, I see that, uh, okay, actually, everything that I need from config manager is just one configuration or two which in this case is uh, which kind of risk we wanted to, to use in this method. Okay, so instead of uh, passing the whole uh, config manager can, that can uh, look in any possible configuration, I just uh, uh, replace and just pass uh, the, the risk, which is a string. So I just change my high level interface. And uh, so in the new decoder uh, from before, after, Basically, instead of uh, passing uh, the config manager, I pass my new facade. And then instead of uh, getting the risk from a config manager, I just get, get risk. So everything is inside the interface. And, uh, and then we do the same uh, with, uh, with the other stuff. And that at the end, uh, it just clean up the code. I mean, it's not a big uh, factor. It's not really anything complicated, but that's the whole point. That I don't need a unit tester to do this kind of uh, substitution. And uh, at the end of the day, I have uh, this uh, uh, data context is something that I, I get from outside, from uh, outside my module. So it can be in the module uh, init or something like that. 
And then uh, my actual code, uh, this uh, response executed, the, the one that uh, I want to put in my code, will be completely um, unrelated to the to connection. It doesn't know absolutely anything about connection and uh, configure manager. And um, another idea is also with a kind of nice alchemical <laughs> is uh, this, in the argument there was this universal solvent that can solve any uh, metal. And uh, we can use the lambdas, because we are in Java 8, so <laughs> at least if, if we can. And um, to simplify when uh, there was a very similar method. So for example here, I have um, a, an interest uh, calculator that uh, uses uh, LIBOR for the rate. And uh, another calculator that uh, uses um, a credit check to do uh, other stuff. And uh, I mean, you can uh, look at uh, the code, uh, apart from the red lines, is identical. So get uh, from something from the loans from ID and then do something on the loans. But the two lines are a bit different. And it's not. I mean, we can kind of create a kind of um, um, a, a, an abstract class on top of the subclass, uh, try to apply the template uh, pattern, for example, or, or the strategy pattern. But uh, I mean, it's a lot of code, and maybe there is also a good reason why we don't want to really to want to, do, to touch the classes. So we can just use uh, Lambda without touching anything else, apart from these two methods. And basically what we do is that, uh, okay, we have uh, those uh, two pieces of code that we want to change. Okay, let's make uh, those two um, block of code to lambdas. And we have one lambdas, which is uh, the init, the context, or whatever is the context. Because the idea of those two pieces of code was uh, to get something and then apply to uh, each loan. And so we can uh, kind of uh, do it this way. And the nice thing is that we don't have even have to specify what we wanted to share between uh, the init uh, and the actual calculation because we can use generics. And uh, it will, uh, it can be a string, it can be a complex object, it can be a number. So after doing this uh, small change of the code, we can see that our classes basically use uh, the uh, the static method and just pass uh, uh, different uh, lambdas. And this is just something simpler that doesn't need a unit test because, I mean, either it works or it doesn't work, so it just touches those two lines of code. And uh, at this point, basically, we should be able to put everything in, I mean, actually, even before this, in the previous one, we should be able to put everything in uh, single modules. So when uh, we have the modules, we can start uh, using unit test. And uh, for the <coughs> for this one, the solver coagula, which was another s phase of uh, in um, alchemy where we took something, uh, we dissolve, and then we co uh, we make a solid, and then solve. It. This was a way to purify. We can. Uh, kind of clean up uh, those uh, kind of spaghetti code, uh, shotgun surgery <laughs> kind of code. So let me show. I, I know that it's a bit, I mean, boring to see code uh, slides, so many. Uh, and anything is uh, on GitHub, so uh, <laughs> if you want to look at it. But just uh, to give you an idea. So this is a nice code that does something really, really fantastic, like writing uh, this output. Uh, the label <laughs> from some address. And um, the current uh, code, uh, that also was something production code that bit to clean up. There was this uh, class printer, label, uh, address, and um, what is the top one? Oh, it's a client. Yeah. That was completely referring each other and uh, using each other in the method. It was quite complicated. So the idea, okay, we have uh, those four classes with a bunch of method uh, that uh, each one uh, is uh, calling each other. And uh, we want, uh, I mean, there should come some uh, fantastic uh, design, but we really have no clue what it will be. 
So one, one solution is, uh, okay, we can look at the code and try to think of something. But uh, there is something that is a bit easier, for me at least. Uh, let's take all the method of all these classes, and uh, let's create a, a public stack, uh, class function, and let's put all the methods here. Uh, they are uh, um, static methods, so they need also to have a parameter with the instance where the method is called, at least if it's using that. But this is just, I mean, copy-paste. Just to take all the methods, put it in a new. And when we have all the methods together in this uh, class, we can start looking at the methods and say, okay, if the method has only one parameter address, that clearly this method should go in the address class. There is no other way. But if a method sent to printer should be something that address sent to printer or should be the printer that have a, a method like a get address? I mean, it's debatable. Probably we, we need to look at the code. But we also can think of something like, uh, we can keep it static. I mean, we can say, uh, we don't know which one, so let's keep a static method that uh, take uh, a printer and the address and put it together. And also the same for the other things. <coughs> and of course, if uh, one of the, um, okay, not, yeah, like uh, the last one. Uh, if one of the parameter is a string, of course, we cannot add the method to a string, so it's clearly go to the printer. And uh, so basically, just moving the method around, uh, we can refactor uh, the main. Basically, this is completely done with the automatic refactoring on IDE. Will be much cleaner than the previous one. Because we have, we have a handless, we have a, a client with an address inside, and then we just say to the printer, print this, uh, uh, to the label to, to pass the printer and the client, and the label will do everything. Which is kind of cool, makes sense. Uh, okay, so I try to <laughs> explain why I think that the rejuvenated legacy code can be more interesting and uh, rewarding than uh, working on a Greenfield project. Um, that's all, so any question? Are you convinced? Not maybe. <laughs> um, I, um, well, it's something that is really passionate about, uh, so um, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm trying to collect a bit of material, maybe to write a book about. Uh, uh, so if you feel like uh, you want to share some ideas or stuff, just let me know. Thank you very much. <laughs>